Hi, I'm Peter Norton. Thanks for tuning in again to Shine TV. Today I'm speaking with Mark Topley from Bridge to Aid, a dental charity doing some amazing work in Africa. He's in Sydney at the moment for the launch of Bridge to Aid Australia. Mark, welcome to Shine TV. Thanks very much for having me. Good to be here. Just to start from the beginning, can you give me some, some background for the Bridge to Aid organisation? Yeah, sure. So we've been working in East Africa for 12 years now uh, and Bridge to Aid's work is basically training rural health workers in emergency dentistry. And those rural health workers are, are locals from, from Tanzania? That's right. So they're employed by the government and they are the people who are based at the rural dispensaries. Uh, they're the main port of call for all kinds of basic health care, trained by the government for three years and then they basically look after all the needs of the community. But a big chunk of their knowledge which is missing is emergency dentistry and that's where we help. Nice one. So you mentioned sort of emergency dentistry. What, what kinds and, and what are the needs of those communities? Well, the overwhelming need in that community is the, is the relief of pain and the prevention of complications. So caries being a very common disease, the world's most common in fact, um, but treatment being almost uh, in, um, unavailable to the vast majority of the population in the developing country, what we're looking to do is to provide a very basic service which will just get people out of pain and then prevent some of the complications which you know, are all too common when you leave an infection and don't treat it properly. Nice. I mean, I think you have some, some slides to show us about the yep. organisation, so, yep. so what's happening there? Um, well, what we're, what we're looking at here is basically what Bridge to Aid is all about, which is the prevention of pain. Um, as I said, you know, 80% of the population uh, in, globally in their lifetime will suffer from caries. Uh, about 60% of people in Tanzania will suffer pain during the course of, of any one particular year. And because all of the clinicians that are trained dentally are based in cities, and the vast majority of the population lives in the rural areas, that leaves people without any kind of access. So when you've got no access and you've got no alternative, then one, you're at risk of complications, but then you also resort to self-treatment as well. So this lady, which I'll show you just here, um, she's got a, an extraordinary draining sinus, um, which is something you would have learned about in dental school, probably only see once or twice in your career, but these are very common conditions that we see uh, in Tanzania. And of course, when the infection doesn't drain properly, then people are at risk from septicemia, which is also you know, something that, that we see. So this little girl here, uh, thankfully we caught her in time. A month before this picture was taken, she came into the health centre where, um, where she, which was local to her, to her house. Um, she, she saw the local health worker. Um, she was unable to get treatment because he wasn't trained in emergency dentistry. So she's sent away with some antibiotics. Then a month later, she's back. Uh, she's got severe anemia. She's got a distended belly. Um, she's in a lot of pain. Um, she's got a, a sinus draining from the, from the upper, upper left side of her, of her jaw. Um, and because we were there with our training teams, training that health worker, we supervised him as he extracted the tooth. She was given more antibiotics. And the next day she comes back, she's a completely different child because she started to recover from the infection. And then three days later when we left, she's almost back to normal. And I think for me, that just goes to show how access at the point of need can prevent some you know, huge amounts of suffering. Um, and she's only weeks from death if we, unless we intervene at that point. So you get, you get conditions like that and then you get ones like this lady. Um, she'd been in pain for seven years before she got so desperate when the antibiotics haven't worked and when painkillers weren't touching the pain anymore when she got her son to extract her tooth with a kitchen knife. So that leads to this huge growth in her mouth. She's unable to eat, she can only, only drink porridge. So she now needs surgery for something which should have been very easy to deal with. And then you also see people like this guy, uh, Matthias, who we met very early on in our, in our work. Um, he went to see somebody untrained who tried to extract his tooth, wasn't successful, but in the process fractured his jaw in two places. But rather than referring him for further treatment, he didn't tell him that he'd been injured. So he now develops a chronic osteomyelitis. He's ostracized from his village because of his, his appearance. He's unable to eat properly. So he now needs reconstructive surgery. And it goes back to what I was saying. You know, simple access at the point of need for these people would really, really help. And it's not saying that training people in emergency dentistry is an alternative to dentists, but we believe it's the necessary alternative when there's nothing else that's available to people. It seems much better than, than no care at all. Well, the WHO calls access to an extraction a fundamental right for everyone. And yet, as I say, more than 70% of the world's population and about 90% of people living in developing countries don't have any access to anybody dentally qualified. And that's something that we want to change. So in terms of the basics, uh, what, would a, what would a standard bridge to aid team look like? 
Okay, well the team, I've got a picture here of a team. Uh, it's basically seven dentists and four nurses. Uh, the nurses are there um, a lot for uh, management of the clinic and cross-infection control, teaching the health workers about cross-infection control and oral health education, and then assisting with the flow of instruments through the clinic. Each one of the dentists is going to work one-to-one uh, -one with a clinical officer, with a health worker, and they're going to take them from day one uh, through a very carefully prescribed and laid out program, which we've tested over, over many years. Um, from day one, simple things like taking a, a patient history, welcoming the patient through on the, on the subsequent days, you know, administration of local anaesthetic, then moving into you know, how, to, how to handle a pair of forceps um, and some simple elevators to around about day five or six when the, the health worker will be doing the, the majority of the extractions, clearly under supervision still, and also learning the limitations as well as skills. So we'll teach people when to refer and when not to attempt an extraction and when they can, when they can proceed safely. So over the course of that, that eight days, we're taking somebody who is clinically qualified and trained already, but not in emergency dentistry, to a point where they can deliver that, that service simply and safely and effectively. And the team is led by a senior dentist who we call um, a site clinical lead. And they're somebody that's been out several times on their programme, so they've, they've been there, they've done it, they've seen most things. So they've, they're experienced and will make sure that the dentists on the team and the nurses on the team feel safe, feel well looked after, and if there's any issues that need to be resolved, they're there to step in, as well as our site manager who works for us. So we have two bridge to aid team on site already, already at, the, at the time who are Tanzanians, so they speak the language, um, they're able to help with, with all, the, all the patient management side of things. Um, so it's, it's a very tight, well-managed, well-defined team, which most people find really refreshing. So when they step into it, they know exactly what their role is. They're able to do their dentistry and do their training for the nine days, get to know each other, have a great time. It's a bit like being back at dental school because everybody's working in the same room. They can call on each other for support make great friendships and at the end of it they've turned out six people who can go back into their communities and, and help their communities into the future and they can go back, go back home knowing that they've, they've uh, done, had a job well done. So you've mentioned work in Africa, is it, is it purely in Africa and specifically in Tanzania that Bridge to Aid operates or is it broader than that? Uh, we've done some programs in Rwanda which are very successful but right now our work is focused on Tanzania. I mean, we'd like to work in other places uh, in the future but at the moment we're responding to an invitation from the government to expand nationally across the country. So that's the main focus of what, of what we're doing. A small organisation, so the resources that we've got are going into that objective at the moment. And you talked about dental services. Is, is that purely Bridge to Aid's involvement or are there other aspects of healthcare that Bridge to Aid assists with? It's the thing that we know about. It's the thing that we do well. And so we've chosen to focus on that. I mean, the systems that we've developed and the way that we deploy volunteers could be transferable for other disciplines. But very much the passion for me and the drive for the organisation is to get people out of pain and prevent them getting into pain in the first place. And for us at the moment, that's, that is dentistry as the driver. I know that a lot of our viewers would be, would be really quite inspired by the work you're doing and, and would be very interested in, in what they could do to help. If, if they were to volunteer, what would, what would a typical experience of a Bridge to Aid volunteer be? Um, it would be an amazing experience, a life-changing experience in many cases. I mean, 40% of the people that come to us come back again, and about 16% of people come back more than once. We've had people that have come 12, 13, 14 times. So it's a very addictive kind of experience. What we want to do, I mean, the, the value that underpins what we do is that we want to look after people and we want to give them a positive experience. You know, the bridge in Bridge to Aid is very much about us being a bridge as an organisation for people to bring their skills and their contribution. So we want to make that as easy as possible. So you go to the website, um, you sign up there, there's a form to fill in. That then goes off to our recruitment team and they'll process it and contact the person and say, okay, you know, we'll, we now need to arrange some further, further interview for you um, just to answer any of questions that you've got. Once we've done that, we can then plug people into, into the system which gets them ready to go. We'll choose a date, um, we'll put them into a team and then we'll arrange the travel that they'll need to do. Um, we'll make sure that we, we ask them for the indemnity certificates they need to provide, or the registration certificates. We walk them through the system, so provided you, provided you respond to the emails, then it's, it's all very simple. And then once you arrive on, on the ground in Tanzania, we basically take over, and you go, into, you go into a process which orientates people to start with. We'll do further briefing in culture and what to do's and don'ts in terms of uh, what, what, we're, what we're looking for them to do, standards of the behaviour that we expect, just because we're working in a different country, we have to respect the culture and the customs of that. 
and then we'll deploy them to the field again under the leadership of the site clinical lead um, and they'll you'll stay in a place which is comfortable which is safe it might not be the five-star hotel uh, that you might experience in a western country but we'll make sure that you're well looked after the last thing we want you to do is get, doing is getting sick um, because you're staying somewhere which where you're, you know you're not eating well um, but most people would say you know it's 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 not a comfortable experience but it's a very re very re rewarding one so we'll bust you backwards and forwards you know there's some driving involved each day to get to the clinics because they're very remote we use remote clinics because our, our desire is to serve the rural community and that's where they are that's where they need to be serviced and that's where the training needs to happen so you do that for nine days and then we bring you back into the the city where wherever it is that you've flown into we give you a nice dinner we get people get a chance to debrief and to unwind uh, there's an option to go off on safari because we're in the middle of safari territory with the serengeti sometimes people do zanzibar zanzibar just for a couple of days of r and r and then people will make their way make their way home it does sound like an amazing experience. You mentioned um, indemnity insurance. I know my certificate of currency in Australia licenses me or insures me for treatment carried out anywhere in Australia. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to, to working overseas with Bridge 2A? Most indemnity companies we've found, and, and um, I could name a few, but most that we've, that we've worked with will extend that cover either for free if you're working with us or for a small fee. And so what we encourage people to do is to contact their indemnity provider straight up and, and say that they're working with Bridge to Aid. And then certainly if they were volunteering from the UK, that cover would be extended um, either for a small administration fee or for free. But you need to have it to practice in Tanzania. It's very key to us that we maintain the ethical standards of the country, that we register with the right authorities and we provide the same level of protection to the dentist and the patient as we'd expect wherever we're working in the world. And in terms of the, the financial side of things, would we expect as an Australian volunteer for any of our expenses to be a tax deduction? Yeah, I mean, the, it, it depends on what the tax deduction system here. I mean, certainly from the UK, if you're, if you're covering the expenses and you're, you, you own your own business as a dentist, then that would be tax deductible. Certainly any contributions you make to Bridge to Aid financially are, are tax deductible. And we're fully registered here with the ACNC uh, and we've got our DGR status and those sorts of things. So going back to a, a more of an environmental question or a, a social environmental question, um, I assume some of our viewers would, would have um, some curiosity about the, the safety level of, mm -hmm. of, of working in certain parts of, of the world. Yeah. What are your views on that? Um, I think each country is different. Uh, Tanzania, in our experience, has always been very safe. I mean, it has its challenges like any country does. I mean, I lived there myself with my family for nine and a half years, um, you know, and, and provided you take precautions as you would in any, any place, then, you know, we'll make sure that, that you're, kept as, you're kept safe. We certainly do risk assessments on the places that we take you to, uh, and that we make sure that our volunteers comply with our code of behaviour so they don't put themselves in any situations where they, where they could get into trouble. Um, and so if an Australian were to volunteer, an Australian dentist were to volunteer, um, can they go at any time or, or are there certain times that Bridge to Aid needs volunteers? Well, the programmes are two weeks long and we run 12 a year, um, but they do fit into specific dates. We have to avoid the rainy seasons. So we tend to do some programmes in September and October, a little bit in November, then we have a gap through to the end of January and then in February, March, and then we'll stop again until June and do a little bit in July and then a break into August. So there are programs happening reg on a regular basis, but they do fit into a very carefully organised and planned schedule. So the best thing to do is to look at the website and that has the dates of all the programs that are coming up posted on there. And one of the things that gives me most concern about volunteering or working in a, in a different country would be the language barrier. Mm -hmm. How do English speaking dentists or dental personnel approach that with, with Bridge to Aid? Um, fortunately, Tanzania um, has English as its second language. So there are two official languages, Kiswahili and, and English. And all um, people are, tr are taught from secondary school upwards in English. So up until that age, they're taught in Kiswahili, and then it suddenly switches into English. So all the health workers that we, that we train speak English pretty well. But if we do get into problems, then we've got our team on the ground and we've also got the district dental officer who's the qualified dentist for the government in that area who's also on site and they can help to translate. So Mark, people who are watching will, will obviously be quite interested to, to know what it's like to be a volunteer with Bridge to Aid. As it happens, we've lined up a, a dentist from Australia who has done some volunteer work with you. Um, her name is Christy. Christy, can you hear me? Yes, Peter, I can hear you. 
G'day, Mark. How are you? I believe you two know each other already. Hi, Christy. It's good to see you again. Welcome to Australia. So, Christy, can you give us an idea of what it was like for you volunteering with Bridge to Aid in Tanzania? The experience is just extraordinary. Mark showed a slide earlier of Matthias, the man who'd had a botched dental extraction resulting in his jaw being broken in two places. Bridge to Aid actually funded Matthias to have a mandibular reconstruction done in Dar es Salaam. And I had later had a very small involvement in making a partial denture for him. On one of his visits to the clinic, he came in with a pumpkin because he's a pumpkin farmer. And that pumpkin would be the equivalent of several days wages for him. And it was just to show his appreciation of everything Bridge to Aid had done for him. On subsequent visits, Matthias happened to come into the clinic and he greeted me like a long lost relative. The generosity of people with very little immaterial possessions can be truly touching. With volunteering in dentistry, you honestly get back more than what you put in. Yes, you work hard, but the rewards are enormous and you make friends for a lifetime. Separate to the whole clinical aspect of Bridge to Aid, when you arrive in Tanzania, you're welcomed into a big family. They honestly couldn't be any more welcoming than they are. And Chrissy, can you tell me what drew you to Bridge to Aid as opposed to towards some other volunteer organisations in similar parts of the world? Well, I'd been wanting to do something like this for a long time. And so when I actually had the opportunity to take some time off of work, I did a bit of a search on the internet and found a few organisations. What I really liked about the Bridge to Aid model was that the fact that you're teaching people and leaving skills behind. And to me, the fact that you're leaving skills behind helps make it a sustainable model. And so, Christy, I, my understanding is that you have done more than one stint with Bridge to Aid. What, what was it about Bridge to Aid that caused you to, or that drew you back to do more than one stint? Well, quite honestly, I thought I'd only do one trip to Tanzania and that would be it. I've been a total of three times now and I'm planning to go again. When they talk about the Bridge to Aid family, that's not a tokenistic term. They honestly welcome you into the Bridge to Aid family. And Tanzania is absolutely an amazing country. I've had the opportunity to travel each time I've been there, from the Serengeti to Ngorogoro Crater and Lake Manyara and Zanzibar. And I've only just touched the surface. There's so much to see in Tanzania. Mark said earlier that the training programs can be addictive. I, I have to agree. The camaraderie, leaving behind skills when you leave and making friends that you have for a lifetime and experience in another culture all into the bargain make it an exceptionally worthwhile experience. Well, Christy, thanks very much for joining us. You're very welcome. Well, Mark, on behalf of Henry Shine and our Shine TV audience, thanks for your time and congratulations on the amazing work you and Bridge to Aid are doing. Thanks very much. Henry Shine are proud to support Bridge to Aid. And if you'd like more information about volunteering with Bridge to Aid Australia, you can use the contact details on your screen. Thanks for watching and see you soon on Shine TV.